Hey, I'm Jordan Gray, and this is the Intentional Life video series. From sex, relationships, communication, and character development, to health, creativity, and self-love, the Intentional Life is your go-to source for powerful, actionable advice from amazing, world-changing people. Hey guys, Jordan from jordangrayconsulting.com here, and welcome back to another episode of the Intentional Life video series. Today, I'm really excited to have a legitimate personal friend who I've been really <laughs> close with over the last year. This is Mike Muscari. Mike, hey, to have you here. What's up? Say hello to the people. Hey, people. I hope you're having an excellent day. People say hello back. So, uh, Mike is the founder of Nano Nutra, the liposomal nutrient company that, or nutritional supplement company that I have referenced in several articles. If you follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen me pouring that magical juice into water <laughs> every morning. I've posted about that at least like a dozen times by now. And uh, also in my Better Sex Diet article, I talk about how I take the supplement every single day. And I met Mike just over a year ago. I'm pretty sure the first night we ever met in person was at the, uh, the Semi Brotherhood meetup group so it was like it was an event that was feeding people into joining up with a weekly men's group and that was the first time we met in person right yeah i think we uh briefly crossed paths during man talks uh you were giving a talk on uh, maybe sex and relationships and we probably shook hands but we certainly didn't know each other really right we were in the same conversation (laughs) yeah Yeah. and so yeah there was maybe 40 or so guys in the room for the for the like men's group feeder event. And I was quite one foot out. I was like, eh, I don't really know. And Mike was sat five or six people away from me. And we went around the room and everyone said, you know, why they were there, what they were looking to get out of the night. And Mike and I's uh, reasons for being there were basically identical. And I was like, okay, I like that guy. So if this guy's in the room, then maybe I will try out this men's group. And that's been over a year and that's been fun. But yeah, it's been a whirlwind of a year since we've totally. <laughs> Lots of adventures. I'm actually I'm probably going to use the photo of us as like the header image for this. So sweet. People already have some context on what our relationship was like. <laughs> um, so let's dig into that first because one of the most common questions that I get about uh, you or your company whenever I post about this stuff is people don't know what liposomal anything is they know what supplements are they know that there are things you can take that are good for your health but what is the liposomal element of your nutritional company sure um liposomes were actually created by the pharma industry like in the 60s um very interesting technology that's kind of tabled for a long time almost like when they were created the world just wasn't ready for the technology but um essentially Liposomes are nanoparticles. Um, They're phospholipids or lipids that are very similar to the material that our cell walls are made up in the body. Um, What we do is we utilize these nanoparticles, these phospholipids, and encapsulate the nutrient that we want to get into your body using these lipids. And they're so tiny that basically what happens is they bypass your digestive system delivering the nutrients straight into the bloodstream and to simplify all of that you're getting a ton more of the nutrient that you're paying for into your bloodstream so it's actually doing something um i don't know about you jordan but like i've taken a ton of supplements over the years and uh i bet a lot of people could relate with this but you go and uh, use the bathroom and you have like neon highlighter yellow piss and that's because you're not absorbing any of the nutrient it's just passing straight through the body and you're you're pissing it out and so you know the invention of liposomes and the way we use it at nano nutra is simply to get a much much greater amount of the nutrient into your bloodstream and used by the body and when you said lipids does that mean they're actually like fat cells or fat bubbles yeah so we utilize sunflower lecithin as our base to make our phospholipid and yeah it's a it's a fatty cell so um nutrients are either fat soluble or water soluble typically 
And so the type of liposome that is used is the opposite of the solubility of the nutrient being delivered. So different liposomal structures are created to uh, encapsulate different types of nutrients. Got it. And so because they're fat soluble, does, I haven't even thought about this and I take yourself, I take five <laughs> different supplements of yours daily. Does that mean that the fat content of like a teaspoon of one of your supplements is like drinking butter or is it not actually fat, fat? No, it's not fat, fat. No. Okay. No. So if you look at the sub facts panel, there's no fat content. It's just the actual material is um, fat soluble lipid, uh, phospholipid. So it's very similar to the material your cell walls are actually made up of. So the best way to think about it is it's actually cell food. So when your cells absorb these lipids, and, and then release the nutrient into the bloodstream, the cell is actually feeding itself with this healthy material um, and, and it's improving the cell quality as well. Got it. Yeah, and for me, the like traditional supplement, neon piss versus liposomal <laughs> supplements is the most yeah. apparent with the B vitamins. When I had totally. a B vitamin complex, I would piss like intensely orange for like, <laughs> a day and a half while being yeah. hydrated, like while drinking multiple liters of water a day. Right. Whereas I'll take a full teaspoon of your B12 and like none of right. it will be in my pee. And I'm like, oh, it's actually going into my body. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, like another simple test that I think you have done, actually I know you've done it and I've certainly done it. Um, certain, certain people in the world are taking high dosages of vitamin C mm -hmm. So maybe they're treating cancer naturally or some sort of autoimmune deficiency naturally. And a part of Lyme their regimen, yeah, is, is part of their regimens is generally high dosages of vitamin C because it's, it's proven to highly boost the immune system. And so if you were to go to, uh, you know, whatever drugstore, Walgreens, London Drugs, whatever it is, and you buy vitamin C tablets, if you were to take, let's say, six of those, maybe six grams of vitamin C or 6,000 milligrams of vitamin C, chances are you would get super sick. You'd be on the toilet for the rest of the day. And I know you've done this. And like for me, biohacking and testing on myself is a big part of like all of my product launches. But I've taken like six or seven teaspoons at one time of our vitamin C product with no stomach upset, you know. And Again, that's like the proof in the pudding that the, the supplementation through the liposomal delivery is actually getting and bypassing digestion. Because if we digested all of that sodium ascorbate, which is the vitamin C, it would just upset the stomach and make it sick, right? So, it's, so those are kind of the fun tests of eff efficacy for me is like, what can I do to see if this is actually working? Like, what can I measure and test in my own life? Yeah, I love to use the phrase proof is in the pudding immediately after talking about diarrhea. <laughs> I was like, or lack of pudding. <laughs> um, Typical J. Gray. But yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's so true that when I used so more than a year ago before I met you, when I was either newly sick, like just had a cold or had an impending cold that I could feel coming on, I would go to the drugstore and get two packets of emergency and I would drink both of them in a glass of water. And yeah, within like Usually within two or three hours, my body would be pissed at me. And I was like, oh, that was too much. Apparently, you're not supposed <laughs> to have 4,000% of your recommended daily vitamin C. But yeah, when I, you know, over last year, any times that I have felt some impending, you know, cold or cough, I've had two, not even teaspoons, I've had two tablespoons in the morning, two tablespoons of the vitamin C liposomal sludge uh, that <laughs> day. <laughs> and yeah, it chases it away faster than anything I've ever experienced. And this isn't just me, like multiple of our mutual friends I know have had the exact same experience. So totally some good shit. Yeah. What's funny about your, your body being pissed at your story when I was like, I think it was probably a freshman in high school. So quite a few years ago freshman now but... for, for Canadians means grade eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, this, these, this product called Smints came out and they were like mints that were vitamins. And, uh, you know, I was at the grocery store with my friends and I bought these and they were delicious. And I must've ate like, you know, 
three quarters of a container of these mints in a day and I was so sick and had no clue until many, many years later why. <laughs> yeah, that it was an yeah. absorption issue, not vitamin C issue. Totally. So what, why this technology? What got you into this and why did you care about this? Like what was, what was the kind of origin story of either you figuring, finding out that this was even a thing, like, oh, liposomals exist in the world because literally when I've talked about this to people, the only people that I know that have even heard the word are in medicine. Like my brother's a public health doctor and he's like, oh yeah, I know about liposomal medicines, right. but even those, like he agreed, are underutilized and not a really huge thing, even right. in big pharma. So right. how did this idea even get on your radar? And then I'm guessing the second part of why you chose it kind of answers itself that it's more efficient, but how did you hear about this thing? Sure, sure. So um, I guess I'll just give you a brief history, but to start um, you know, back, back when I was a financial strategist, that was my business. And then I, you know, got really tired of what I was doing. It just really wasn't fulfilling to me. I knew that I had like zero control over financial markets and it just stressed me out and <laughs> thinking about people's money and what I was doing with my time and energy. And um, I quit and launched a fundraising business, another little entrepreneurial endeavor to help like local organizations. Um, it kind of went belly up after a year or so I ran out of funds. And uh, I was just working contract for a design firm and then also for a uh, supplement company. And I got really into the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss. Um, it just that had kind of become my lifestyle design Bible. And one of the things Ferriss talked about was like, look at products that you already know, like, and use and innovate them. Find a way to make them better, uh, remarket them and create an innovation. And so that was right up my alley. I already had a design background. So it, so I was taking a product at the time called uh, Jade Green Zymes, which was to me just this really kick-ass green powder. Um, I took it every day. I loved it. Um, but I was always trying to share it with friends and family and everybody hated it. You know, it's like, oh, it tastes like grass and it sticks to the glass and it's really hard to clean the glass after you take it. And so like nobody would even give it a shot because of the taste and, and just kind of how hard it was to deal with. So I decided like this is my niche. I'm going to optimize or innovate this green supplement. And what I did was I started looking for manufacturing partners and I learned a lot about Ayurvedic plant-based medicine and I thought Ay Ayurveda was really cool and it has, you know, thousands of years of history and I was like, okay, this is something I could get behind. And what we did was we formulated a green supplement that had a whole variety of Ayurvedic digestive herbs and enzymes in addition to the green supplements like wheatgrass, barley grass, alfalfa, spirulina. And I created my first product, which was uh, called Immunity Support Plus, and it was a green tablet. So no longer did you have to mix this in a glass and have all the chores and pains of, you know, the powder. And so that's how I got my launch, you know, in the supplement industry. And at that time, I had actually recently started eating a vegetarian diet, and I was on this huge plant-based diet kick and just... Uh, my whole supplement line became Ayurvedic plant-based formulations and um, I really loved what I did and my products and my company started taking off and um, as you get into the industry and you start meeting more and more people you just hear about different products and um, I was working with a writer over at Natural News which is a big online publication in the States, The Health Ranger. And um, one of the writers was asking me if I'd ever heard about liposomal technology because he was taking my green sup and he was like, I really like it. I was curious if you've ever heard about liposomes. And I was like, mm, liposomes? I felt kind of clueless. Like I would say probably, <laughs> you know, 99.9% .9 of the general population hasn't really heard about liposomes, like you said, unless you're a doctor in the industry. And so even I hadn't heard about it, and I just started doing a ton of research, uh, looking into liposomes, saw pharma was using it, saw that, you know, there were 
one or two small supplement companies out there utilizing liposomes in their formulations. And there's just a lit a fire uh, for me because I, at the end of the day, created a product because I really liked it and took it. But even the product that I created wasn't solving the digestion issue. And like, in my personal opinion, you know, I think plant-based supplements are much more easier to digest and to get into the system, but they're still not solving the problem that digestion by nature is just a very destructive process. So as I learned more and more about liposomes and I was reading like PubMed studies and other studies that have been done on absorption rates of liposomes, I was like, okay, this is the future. Like, what I'm doing right now is the past and this is the future. And I pretty much decided right then and there that this is what I was going to do and um, that I was going to work on a liposomal line of products and <clears throat> help be one of the people that brings this to the general public's knowledge base. And I started you know, looking for manufacturer partners and just trying to figure out how to launch this line. The name Nano Nutra just came to me pretty instantly because I'm like, oh, it's like nanotech with nutraceuticals, so Nano Nutra, right? And I saw the vision for the logo design in my mind and just ran with it. And what I found are there are very, very few manufacturers in North America that can produce real liposomal technology. There are a lot of companies that claim to that create emulsions um, <clears throat> using like chemical synthesis. But uh, to create true pure liposomes without heat or pressure, there are very few manufacturers to do that. And I found some really good partners, launched uh, the vitamin C product as my first, and then just slowly grew one after the next um, as I was able to afford it. So, you know, I, I think you and I know each other really well. And kind of like you, you know, we just started grassroots. I didn't ever have financial backers or funding partners. It was just all my own efforts. And so as one product pay for itself, I would then reinvest that money to launch the next. Yeah, you've been <clears throat> blown up ever since. I'm I'm not surprised when you said that there's very few places that can actually manufacture lipos liposomes properly because from an outside perspective, it sounds like magic. Like it literally <laughs> sounds like, oh yeah, you have these like little fat cells and like they encapsulate nutrients inside of them and you know, like, <laughs> what machine does this i don't know yeah I'm clearly not my industry or realm but like that's, un that's not surprising that not every place can do it oh yeah of course we've got that machine that's you know from the 60s and no one uses it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah you mentioned uh taking on a vegetarian diet around the time that you were building immunity support was that for health reasons, for moral reasons, what got you into vegetarianism? Um, well, I had certainly watched a lot of the documentaries, um, you know, like Food Inc. and uh, like Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, those type of documentaries, I guess, at, at the time. But although I really did care about, you know, like the planet, it wasn't like this huge push for me. So I started slowly cutting meat out of my diet because I was like a very – meat heavy eater at the time and I actually used to like pride myself that like oh, I'm like vegetables or that's rabbit food like I'm not a rabbit I don't eat that you know and um, actually what happened is I went on a personal development retreat with a mentor of mine uh, it was the first thing of this sort that I'd ever done before and it was uh, in Tulum Mexico and I was there for two weeks, and where we were staying, this resort we were at in Tulum, only served vegetarian food. And I was actually dreading it going into the retreat. I'm like, I'm going to wither away. You know, I had How all these. How long was the retreat? Was it like a full week or five days? Or... Uh, the retreat was 10 days, and I, I stayed there for 14 days. Hmm. And so, yeah, what happened was I'm eating this vegetarian diet and I was fully committed. I'm like, I'm going to go do something new. Like, I'm not going to go to other restaurants and cheat. Like, I'm going to give it a chance. And um, about seven days in, I uh, noticed an increase in my personal energy. I was waking up earlier and just felt very vibrant. And, um, you know, I was also in Mexico on retreat and like swimming the ocean every day. So I'm sure a lot of things contributed to that. I'm not naive to that fact. But what happened was I was leaving and I'm in the Cancun airport 
and you know airport food and uh, I was pretty hungry and I'm like oh Johnny Rockets like I haven't had a giant cheeseburger in 14 days and so you know I just got a cheeseburger and fries and I really felt awful which that probably again was like I didn't make the best choice in what I put into my body at that moment but for whatever reason that just clicked and I was like, man, I'm over eating meat at this stage in my life. And that was six and a half years ago. So I've just stuck with it. It tends to work for me, the vegetarian diet. And so I rock it, you know, so it works for me. Interesting. Yeah. It's, you know, it makes total sense for me to have you on the show, the intentional life, because you are one of my offline friends that, lives with the most intentionality you really live you know every quadrant of your life with a lot of purpose and thoughtfulness and you know there's no area of your life where i see you just like sliding through and you know that <laughs> resonates with a lot of you know, of my readership and, and followers and what people generally are that follow my content is you know we're we're more on the side of like type a overachiever over functioning people versus like you know, lazy video game player, um, you know, do nothing people. <laughs> and For yeah, sure. so I knew there'd be some story behind that. Speaking of <laughs> living a life of purpose, uh, <laughs> soon after meeting you, you went and lived in a van <laughs> by <laughs> choice for half a year. Um, yeah. What led up to that? What was that like? Tell me about that phase of your life for... All the yeah. followers who haven't yet lived in a van. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess at that stage, uh, I'd been running my company for several years, and I had a lot of freedom. And um, I'd just gone through like a pretty tough breakup with a really great person, and she actually introduced me to a lot of my friend circle in the Vancouver area, and I think we both needed space. And... Um, we lived together at the time, right? And so it was like the big shift in our lives. And so I decided, hey, you know, this is a great time to reset my life, rediscover like who I am and who I want to be in the world. And um, I don't know, the, the vagabond van life style just kind of appealed to me. And I was like really into surfing. I still am. I love it. It's one of my favorite flow state activities. And so, yeah, I decided also that I wanted to like embrace kind of this off grid, producing my own power via solar energy and just like be as zero waste as I possibly could be water consumption, all the things. And so, yeah, I just decided to get a van. I decked it out with solar panels and had like a full on off grid setup so I could be really anywhere and have power run my company. Uh, tethered to my phone's internet or just work out of coffee shops and what I did was just focused a lot of my energy and efforts on my own inner world and like who I wanted to be as a person how I wanted to show up when I re-emerged <laughs> back into my friend circle in the community and uh, just to have a lot of fun and so one of the things that I did on that trip was I made this pact with myself to do one thing every day that made me feel alive and that's really carried through into my life. I, I try to do that day in and day out. And some days I miss the mark, but normally I do something. And for me, doing one day, one thing every day that makes me feel alive could be any number of things from surfing, rock climbing, having a hard, hard conversation, having a really uh, emotional or, or like in depth conversation with a friend or family member, coaching, supporting helping other people to bring their ideas into existence, like all those things just light me up and they make my wor my life worth living. Um, and I look at like my own purpose in life and I see that there are qualities about me that are my gifts that I naturally have to express and give to other people who want them. And so that's a part of me being alive is just having outlets to utilize and give my gifts to the world. And so the van life journey was really all about that. And, um, yeah, it was like seven months in this van with my dog, <laughs> which he was my saving grace. Um, but it was a, it was a lonely trek, um, a lot of alone time, but I also just learned a ton about myself and a lot about what was important to me and my life. Yeah. What was, 
what was the day-to-day -day reality of it? Was it a lot of like sitting in the van? Oh, oh, for context, for people that follow me on Instagram, Mike is the owner of <laughs> Baby Dinosaur, the, the skinny little whippet dog, the, the white dog. Um, I just forgot that people, at least a chunk of the viewers, totally know who your dog is. Um, Deer is famous. <laughs> yeah, and his real name is Deer, not Baby Dinosaur. Yeah. Um, Insta famous. So yeah, was it was it you and Deer like looking out of the side of the van at the beach? Was it you journaling a ton? Was it like finding parking lots and restaurants to like live out of? What was you know what was like the bulk of it? Was it yeah. Um, my day to day was different a lot, but a lot of what you said I did. Um, what I would normally do once I was settled in an area, settled for me could have been, yeah, finding parking on the street that was unrestricted, that I could stay there for days on end or hours. Um, but once I was settled in an area, you know, I would, I would generally in the mornings get up very early, uh, let the dog get out for a rip, go check the waves. If the waves were, were bumping, I'd be out surfing. If they weren't, I'd find a coffee shop or somewhere to go and work. Did you have your and, own board or were you renting surfboards? No, I had a couple boards yeah, with me on the trip. Hmm. Um, I actually bought my very first surfboard on this trip, so it was super cool. Um, nostalgic. But uh, yeah, I would, I would check it out and if nothing was happening, I would go and get my work done. So I do this now, but I really like to work early mornings. I like to work from 8 a.m. till usually 11.30 solid and just be hyper-focused and trying to knock out everything that I possibly could get done in that window. So then I felt like accomplished for the day and then I could go out and play. So um, I, I would usually get my day going in one of those ways, working or surfing, and then flip-flop whatever I didn't do in the afternoon. Um, I made a lot of effort to go random places, juice bars, um, yoga classes, things like that to try and meet people and connect with other other people. And what ended up happening a lot of times too is I would just meet random people near surf breaks and I would have conversations with people that I otherwise would have wrote off or just never connected with. And uh, that was really impactful. Everybody <laughs> that I met just wants to tell their story, they want to be heard, and they want to connect with other humans. And I learned just like a ton um, in, in the realm of being empathetic and compassionate about what everyone's going through in their life. And that, you know, sometimes I was too judgmental of other people. And um, you never know how you're going to respond to a circumstance, whether it's a breakup, or you're addicted to something, or you lose your job, like things affect us in different ways at different points in, in time. And I learned a lot about that just talking to random people. Um, I would I would also I was big into Wim Hof method, I still am. Um, so every day, I would do 30 to 40 minutes of Wim Hof and meditation on the beach followed up by uh, push-ups and uh, stretching. Um, I spent a ton of time on the beach just reflecting on my life and just listening to the sounds of the ocean. And then I also did a whole bunch of, um, of, of journaling, as you mentioned. So I found for me, being that I didn't really have many people to talk to and when you just move away out of the blue, you're kind of out of sight, out of mind. And like people do want to connect with you back home, but everyone lives very busy lives and you're just not on the top of their mind. So I found that I really needed to journal and just get my thoughts out on paper so I didn't go crazy. So I did a ton of journaling. Um, one of the other things I did uh, was I microdosed psilocybin once every three days. And for me, I'd, I'd read the Psychedelics Explorer's Guide, and microdosing was a way to help bring up trapped emotions, blocked emotions, and allow them to surface in a way to where I could consciously process them and move through them and just understand myself better. So yeah, it was a lot of deep internal reflection, playing, connecting with nature, connecting with random people. Um, drinking a lot of good coffee and eating a lot of good food at just random places that people would suggest. I would kind of let the path dictate what I did too. If someone I met was like, hey, you should go eat, you know, at XYZ, I'd be like, cool, 
let's do it. Like I'll go right now. And so I just kind of let my journey dictate itself. Um, I spent a lot of time in like North County, San Diego, and I um, spent a lot of time meditating too in the gardens of uh, Yogananda's um, retreat center or ashram, whatever you want to call it, uh, in San Diego. And so that was also a really cool thing to be able to do. So, hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's like clearly just one of those chunks of life that you look back on and be like, yeah, that was like, a, that was man that was necessary that was a turning point that was really valuable you know you could you could be married and like kind of location locked somewhere a decade from now and be like that was a thing that happened at that age and not that it won't happen again but just yeah yeah you just you can't plan for the various branches of value that come out of a thing like that um yeah, I've written before extensively about the gap between, you know, being alone and or aloneness and feeling lonely. Yeah. And I can't help but think that a seven month span of living by yourself in a van would inevitably, for the majority of people, allow themselves to be more comfortable with being in their own company. That if you don't have people to constantly kind of, you know, socializing can be used and relationships, intimate or social can be used as a form of self-medication. I know some more polarized extroverts that are like desperately uncomfortable when they're not around people. Like they want people to be around them almost until they go to bed at night. They just, they need that distraction of social stimulation. And yes, you had your dog who can't, you know, talk back to you. They communicate, yeah. but they don't speak English. Right. No dog that I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, did, did you feel a stronger foundation of I'm at peace with myself at the end of the seven months of like, I've lived through that. I didn't lose my mind and I have a more grounded center or how did you feel at the end of it? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, I think it's very, very, it was very easy for me to bypass what was going on in my life, what was going on emotionally through having fun with friends and just having that, what, what I think to be more of a healthy distraction than some of the other distractions out there. But that was definitely what I did. You know, if something went bad, I would have the support of all these amazing people and, you know, just kind of bypass through it. So yeah, being alone for that amount of time really helped me to ground in who I am and, and enjoy my own company. And I kind of found that I, I think, you know, relating back to when I said I was a financial advisor and thinking about clients' money and what was going on would keep me up at night. <clears throat> it's the same. I think we don't like to be alone. I'm making a generalized statement, but people don't like to be alone because the thoughts in their head aren't always things that they want to be thinking about. And so we'd rather turn those thoughts off with something to do, whether it's a movie or a video game or going out with friends or whatever it is, um, than have to face those thoughts. And so that's where, you know, like doing the microdosing of psilocybin and like journaling a ton and meditating a bunch, doing Wim Hof breathing uh, brings up so many emotional releases. So I really felt like I got to work through a lot of these internal thoughts that I'd been maybe avoiding or, or skirting around in certain ways. And I, I didn't have a choice but to face them head on because there was nothing, nothing really else to do. And so... In that period, even though I said, you know, I was working every day, I, I chose to work as minimally as I possibly could right, because I, yeah, exactly. Because I really just wanted to focus on my life. So I, I didn't have like a lot of stressor coming from the business. So it was like, gave me this opportunity to do this work that I thought was really important. And now I feel much more free and liberated. So, you know, when the weekend comes around and nobody's around and I'm just sitting at home, you know, it's no big deal. You know, I'm happy to be on my own much more than I ever was. And, and I love the, the distinction alone versus lonely, you know, like lonely is this longing, this needing, this desiring someone else to fulfill us. And aloneness is being happy with my own company, you know, being happy with my own presence and be like, yeah, like I'm actually a cool dude. I could sit with myself all day and not, <laughs> it wouldn't bother me, you know? So I like that. Yeah. And I think that 
you know, it's like a really like 30,000 foot view meta. I think that loneliness is really only experienced by people that are still in what one could argue as somewhat of a dream state because they're still believing in the idea of separation that, you know, I'm this like, I'm this one person, this is my worldview, I'm not connecting to people as if we aren't intrinsically connected all the time with people, whether we are physically in their proximity or not. And yeah, like that's where that pain of loneliness comes from as a derivative of being alone is that, yeah, it's that thing of like getting overly caught up in the, the drama or the story of I'm an alone person. There's just me and there's no one here. It's like, yeah. eh. it's one way to rationalize that. Um, um, yeah. There's so many things I wanted to unpack in that. <laughs> I mean, this to me is like, I, you know, no one watching this will be surprised about this next paragraph of statements that I am a huge proponent proponent of leaning into your emotions. And, you know, there's the, the Michael Brown quote of life isn't about feeling better. Life is about getting better at feeling. And I think that every, every human being's natural state is peace, love, joy, and abundance. But what is in the way of those things is the kind of accumulated emotional pain that we haven't allowed ourselves to process. And, you know, this is one of the reasons a lot of people are afraid to meditate or like you said, afraid to be alone or afraid to go to bed by themselves at night with their own thoughts because there's unresolved pain they don't want to face. And it's scary to lean into that stuff, but it's the only way, like it's absolutely mandatory that we go through this stuff and your van life escapades are such a, perfect microcosm of what that process looks like and you know one thing that I find um you know interesting or some some word is there have been a few client calls especially over the last month that I've had where I've talked to people who have you know they've known of me for months or years even and have been following my stuff and they know like there are these looming things in their life that they've been proactively sprinting away from and ignoring for months or for years. And they've hopped on a call with me within our first coaching call. And they've said things like, oh, like, but now, you know, I've said these things out loud and you've seen these things in me and they've been validated. (laughs) Now that they've been named, they're more real. And, you know, to some extent, I feel worse at the end of our call because now I really have to face this stuff that I've been putting off for so long. And, you know, this is really the process of, of alchemy in order to transform something from one thing to another, um, you know, the philosopher's stone, turning things into gold, you, there has to be that heating process where you like, you get uncomfortable and I'm sure it wasn't easy to kind of cook yourself probably (laughs) literally and metaphorically based on the San Diego heat of the time of the year, but (laughs) you know, sitting in a van and leaning into this stuff with journaling, with Wim Hof, with psilocybin, you know, this isn't an easy process. I'm sure there were days where you're bawling your eyes out and you're like, fuck, I just want to, you know, talk to my parents or get a hug from a woman that I know or be with Mm -hmm. my old friends. Like it's not an easy process to lean into, but that's the warrior's path. Like that's, it's such a mandatory piece. I'm getting lit up about this because (laughs) I'm so into and something that I also see a huge disparity in how a lot of society is not only run, but, you know, encouraged to be not just, you know, Men are the only ones who are emotionally suppressed and say, you know, boys don't cry. Or you're only allowed to feel like happy or angry and no other emotions. Women right. get their own version of emotional suppression. Like they're not allowed, they're not allowed to be angry. They, they have to be nice and sweet and accommodating. So it's across the board. But yeah, you just, you went on how I perceive your van life escapades. It was really like the most self-honoring six months you could possibly have after a breakup of how do I feel my feelings? How do I get back to my emotional center and figure out who I want to be next in the world? And like, if there was, if there was a supplement or there was a capsule that encapsulated <laughs> that part of you, like the world, we're, we're working on it. Take, we're working on it. <laughs> there's only, yeah. There's, yeah, there's no company that life was is that yet, but no, no we're no. looking for them. <sighs> yeah. No, and, and just, just to touch on a little bit of that, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that 
I think I had been running from in my own way is that I viewed love as performance based. You know, I was lovable when I performed according to the expectations of whoever was closest to me. And then that made me in turn very controlling and judgmental, you know, on, on the other end of the coin. And it's like, for me, it was just like a super vicious cycle, you know, where I seen that I'd had the same pattern over and over in my romantic relationships. And like, even in my closest of friendships, things would end up getting competitive. And like a lot of that was due to just my kind of misguided understanding of what love was and, and how to love others and how to love myself and what was really important in life. And so, yeah, I, I think everything you said really encapsulates, <clears throat> you know, my journey. Yeah. And, and even the, you know, the control issues of the judgmentalness, like, yeah, these things, you know, they're not character defects. Like they're literally, as you said, they're just blocks to love. Like that's the, the stuff that I was talking about. Like, yeah, like everyone has peace, love, joy, and abundance as their natural state. We just have to like do the work of like letting go of these things that are like, you know, kind of lies. Like they're, they're not right. us. They're just adaptive survival mechanisms, mechanisms that we learned earlier on in life that we just have to acknowledge and be like, oh, this is a thing. I can let go of this now. Agreed. They weren't inherently who I was. They were learned behaviors, learned traits. And, you know, I talk a lot about this and, you know, the masterminds that I run and, and the men's group work that I do as well. But we're very judgmental of ourselves and very hard on ourselves about these things. And then once we develop an awareness, we want them to go away overnight, you know. And I think about my own like performance based love, you know, ideas about myself and how much I wanted it to go away and how much I wanted to be free. And then it dawned to me like, okay, you've been living your life this way for let's say 25 years, you know, what are the odds that this magic switch is just going to flip and you're just going to be like perfect or fixed, you know, and seeing things differently and doing things differently tomorrow. And yeah, so it's, it's a constant, Thing, and these things still come up for me, right? These, these ideas, these performance-based love ideas and judgments and criticisms of myself and others, they still come up all the time. And they're things that, you know, the more mindful I become, the quicker I could shut them down and turn them off and say like, oh no, I don't want to do myself that way anymore, right? I want to, I want to operate from a different paradigm now, but it takes time. So to all the viewers, you know, that, that anyone's dealing with these type of things, just be easy on yourself. That's my greatest piece of advice is just give yourself space, be easy on yourself. Things, things take time to shift for sure. So. Yeah. Mark Manson has an article called shut up and be patient. That's <laughs> exactly what this process that is like, whenever we decide to make a decision, um, he draws the, the kind of visual analogy of when the people on the, on the Titanic saw the iceberg straight ahead and you know decide okay we need to turn now it wasn't oh we decided to make a turn so now we're just going to like immediately turn and and move there's already pre-existing momentum behind the ship it's going to keep even if you say hard left you're still mainly going to keep moving forward and crash right. into the iceberg right and yeah this is how any behavioral uh you know deep-seated behavioral pattern exists in us we can say yeah i'm letting go of shame or performance based, based mindset or judgmentalism or any number of things that we address and acknowledge but there's going to be that same kind of momentum swing that the titanic had that yes you can make some progress right away and things take time and i think that especially you know as we have both we're, we're both in our 30s but we've both recently been in our 20s which i mainly <laughs> see as a decade is or as a life stage there's a lot to be said about it just being like an anxious status seeking find yourself in the you know find where you fit in the world type decade you're just throwing shit at the wall you you like totally. are beginning to know yourself somewhat and yeah so any change that you're deciding to make like you just become aware of them in that decade and then it's gonna not happen overnight yeah and, and you know going back to almost the beginning of the conversation but one of the things that I really learned from my very great and deceased mentor, Napoleon Hill, who unfortunately I uh, never met because he died before I was born, but you know, his work taught me to live with definiteness of purpose in everything that I do. 
And I think, you know, the younger we can learn to live with purpose, you know, the less of that chaotic, <laughs> just out of control energy, you know, people are going to have in their 20s. If, if we could learn to like figure out who do I want to be in the world, stop thinking about what we want to do, but think about like, how do I want to show up in the world? Who do I want to be? What presence do I want to give to the world? What gifts do I have to give to the world? Like, what are my inherent traits and qualities that make me feel good about being me? And if we could, you know, help to educate younger people to live with that type of purpose much earlier in life, I think like the trajectory of moving through a lot of these things will be just insanely increased. Totally. Yeah, that distinction of being versus doing in in the conversation of life purpose, I wish that that had been really pushed on me like at least a decade earlier than <laughs> than it was because, yeah, yeah I had a lot of... Uh, swirling thoughts around like is this the perfect iteration of what i should be doing in the world versus you know th that's a very in the trenches kind of mindset versus yeah. the right but what's the core intention what's the emotion what's the underlying intention that's moving everything that i'm doing because for me it feels like it feels right in my bones to think my purpose in life is to just be loving like be loving be kind and have that you know permeate every action all the doing that i do in my life versus you know oh is is blogging my thing and is blogging on this website my thing or our video is okay and like i've really kind of taken off these self-imposed handcuffs especially over the last six months which my followers have probably acknowledged or realized <laughs> that you know i'm really like widening the umbrella of the breadth and depth and format of topics i'm putting out there because yeah i kind of like go of this like oh but my doing should only look like this, which is totally arbitrary and false. You know, all of my uh, greatest mentors and, you know, people that I look up to in the world, they're all very multidisciplinary, um, you know, very prolific people. Uh, you know, Paul Simon, Dave Maxwell, Ryan Holiday, uh, these people that are usually multi-format, multi-genre, multi-topic. Um, yeah, they're just... As Walt Whitman said, you know, do I contradict myself? Then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. You know, we're allowed to have multiple pieces, not only at different phases in our life, but simultaneously. So uh, what do you see as being the epicenter or like the core focus of what your life's purpose is? Like what would the, the center of the mind map be of like, this is what my life is about? For mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, my, my purpose kind of has three pillars to it in a sense. And the first one is love and harmony. So I want to have only loving and harmonious relationships in my life. Um, and going back to the being, that takes me being this loving and harmonious per person, right? And it, t it takes me doing a lot of things day in and day out. So And in your relationship to yourself, I'm guessing, not just oh, to other people. That's other. the number That's the number one, yeah, for sure. Um Second is I want to be vibrantly, perfectly healthy. I want to maintain my health. And so again, there are certain things that I have to do to be that person, right? So the doing is dictated by the being. So eating healthy, exercising, supplementing, you know, meditating, taking time for myself. Like there are a lot of things that I have to do. One of the things I have on my health, uh, on my purpose document is, is laugh for any reason and you now express gratitude for any reason. It's just like, there are certain things that make me feel good. Connect with nature, connect with the source. You know, there's so many things. And then third is freedom. So, you know, in my life, I really value freedom and we're blessed in North America. Most of us live very free lives and, um, we choose to put ourselves in and out of different self-imposed prisons of our thoughts or our circumstances. But, you know, for me, uh, a part of my lifestyle design and building the company that I've built was all about having freedom in my life, freedom to travel and work from where I wanted to work, you know, freedom to spend time with people that are really important to me. Um, you know, financial freedom is a big piece of that. And so developing um, an organization that allows me to do 
what I want to do in the world and to be who I want to be in the world is a big part of my freedom. And one of the largest parts of freedom for me is also this saying that when the things that I think, say, and do are congruent, I'm free. So if I'm saying something, I'm doing it, and I'm thinking it, I'm completely free. I could be doing probably almost anything, and as long as I'm being really honest with myself and everybody else, I have nothing to worry about. It's just like, this is how I'm, this is how I'm rolling. Like You can do what you want with it, but this is what's happening for me. And so I've really found that just being radically honest in my life and radically honest with uh, everybody um, gives me this insane amount of freedom that uh, I never had before. I kind of lived this way. I love the being, thinking, doing conversation. You know, basically, you're talking about alignment. Are you living in integrity with yourself? Are you, are you being in alignment with yourself? And uh, I've actually I've talked about this zero times in any public public place, but. I find it so over the last couple of years, you know, I've had my website going for about four and a half, just under five years now. And there have been like at least two dozen people approaching me that are, you know, that are business people basically. And they specialize in online marketing and online funnels and all this kind of stuff. And they'll approach me and say, you know, you have such a large readership. And you are severely under monetized. Like, how come you have no ads on your site? How come? How come this or that? And I have told you directly once that yeah. uh, there was one situation where a guy approached me. This is over two years ago now, and he said, "You know, I want to part partner with you on this project, or I'm making this digital product, and it'll be like sex focused. And we're, you know, within the next six months, like literally within this calendar year, we can scale up this product to the point where you're making a seven figure personal rev revenue. Like, you'll be making over a million dollars a year." And yeah, like, are you interested? And I was like, how are you going to do this? Like, where, where would you be advertising this product? He said, oh, on porn sites. Like, porn sites convert really well. And for me, that was yeah. a deal breaker. I was like, yeah. like, there's no, you know, you can't sell your integrity. You have to be in alignment with yourself and, at all times. And same thing with like having zero ads on my site ever. Like, I've had, yeah, and this is where the dozens of marketers coming to me and thing, they're like, how come you have no ads in your site? You have like a million readers. This is ridiculous. But I know myself well enough to know that in order for me to fall asleep at night and to feel like I'm putting out the best version of you know what what a like a well life live well lived life mm -hmm. looks like a to life me. lived well <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah um, that yeah that there's just there's no price you can put on your integrity and yeah, that conversation around alignment. Like, you know, one person in alignment is more effective than a thousand people out of alignment. It just, there's so much potency and power behind, are you listening to your heart and are you honoring what it's telling you and living your life that way? Because if you are, good things are inevitable. Yeah. Uh, all you're saying reminds me of like one of my favorite songs and I'm sure you know this, but it's Macklemore's Make the Money. And yeah. uh his line is make the money, don't let the money make you, change the game, don't let the game change you. And dude, I listen to that song probably every day. It just amps me up and it's like, am I doing what's good? You know, am I doing good in the world? Am I being who I want to be? Or am I like selling out? You know, and it's it's easy to do. Like you said, when people approach you and um give you an opportunity that seems lucrative, you know, and at the end of the day, sleeping is more important for sure. <laughs> exactly. So, All right. Second last question. Are there uh, any supplements that you take on a daily basis that are not from your product line? <laughs> loaded. Loaded questions. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I do take a Pure Bis uh, magnesium supplement. Um, we are working on nanonutra magnesium here for the future, uh, but it's still a little ways out. Um, but I, I do take that daily. I also, um, I take pine pollen, um, pretty much a few times a week at a minimum. And then, uh, I will, I will do a plant-based, uh, protein just like supplementing meals and so on. But, um, outside of that for the last good while, that's, that's been it for me. It's been the essentials. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's funny. My like nutritional medicine cabinet has gotten smaller and smaller <laughs> as I've consolidated into just taking like your products on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and again, for anyone that follows me on Instagram or has read a good number of my blog posts, you know that I'm not bullshitting. That's just what I take every morning and at night if I feel any impending sickness come on, which is increasingly rare because the shit works. Um, <laughs> any... Are there any points in your overall life philosophy that I didn't ask you about that you want to put forth of like, you know, what you believe about health or money or friendships or, you know, or do you feel complete with what we touched on? I think we hit a lot of it. I, I would just retouch on being congruent, you know. Um, hmm, yeah, just being integrity with what works for you, you know, do what is right for you and don't lie to yourself. You know, that's, that's like the, <laughs> it's so easy to do. It doesn't seem like it is, but, um, yeah, you only lie to yourself for so long until your, yeah, your body and your heart will like throw a revolt and be like, yeah, Hey, shut, listen shut down. To us. Yeah. Yeah. So really the keys, is just like being, being really honest with myself and with, with others living on purpose you know, designing all aspects of how you want your life to be and going out there and getting it. You know, there's like uh, The Secret was a great book in terms of like a jump starter of like ideas for me, but it was missing a huge piece, which was like action. Like you can sit around and think good thoughts and write out your purpose and, you know, all of these intention settings uh, and mantras or whatever, but until you get out and do the work that it's going to take to make those changes, it's not going to happen. So for me being intentional in all areas of my life and, and putting the pieces in place and doing the work that it takes to, to manifest and live that life is super important. And I think at the end of the day, just being the best person I could be is super important to me because I don't actually see any other real purpose on this planet it's like just constantly evolving who we are into a grander and grander version um that's it like how awesome can life be you know and how much can we aid others to have super awesome lives as well and that's i guess that's where i would end yeah insights in action alignment <laughs> pretty pretty comprehensive worldview there yeah that'll that'll definitely get you places Cool, Mike. Thanks so awesome. much for being yep. on the show. Nanoneutral.com is the, the main hub. I'll have links to everything in the show notes and down below. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for being on. This is awesome. I love getting to pick your brain. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, nanoneutralusa.com still. Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, but no you could just Google nanoneutra and will be the first thing that pops up for sure. So. Doesn't that feel good? Remember people are like, oh, what's your website? I'm like, just Google my name. It's, you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just type it in. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much. You guys uh, all have an amazing day.